tell me what's wrong and why you never said you felt that way Cause you're trying to stay strong and fake a smile until I look away But I've known you too long, it hurts to watch your blue eyes fade Dr. to Dr. Miller landed in Russia and made his way to Moscow As he drove to his mom's house, he had nothing but his thoughts to keep him company He hadn't been in Russia since he fled with Zara That's right, Zara, as in Zara Dragovich A.K.A. Drago. She was the love of Dr. Miller's life. He was so hurt when she got caught up with the wrong crowd. She was the daughter of a Russian crime boss. It was only a matter of time before her natural instincts kicked in. Drago was destined to live a life of crime. He wasn't surprised to hear she'd ended up getting killed in Wentworth. Being back in Russia was bringing up all sorts of feelings in Dr. Miller and he did not like it one bit. He was becoming angry. He let out an angry growl and pulled the car over. He just needed a minute to compose himself. He took a few deep breaths and continued to drive. Oi, I was supposed to be let out yesterday. What the fuck's the hold up? Shut your trap, Kelly. Lou started pacing back and forth. She hated being in the slot. It reminded her of when her mom used to lock her in the closet. I wish you'd never been born. You're just like your father. Useless. No, mom, please don't. I'm afraid of the dark. As Lou was having this flashback of her and her mom, she felt her body tremble. She stared at the cell door. Before she knew it, she was running towards it head first. She bashed her head against that door and fell to the ground. She started to cry, both from the pain and from the realization that she was still awake. She just wanted to knock herself out to stop the memories. She did not want to remember. She sat there against that door, bleeding and crying. Don't cry. It won't make you feel any better. Not while you're in here, anyway. Nothing makes me feel better. Same here. It's this place. It destroys everything. How long are you in for? Life. What'd you do? I killed two cops. What are you in here for? No, I didn't do anything. I was set up. Yeah, right. No, it's true. I... I'm innocent. Well, not anymore, you're not. No one in here is innocent. And even if you were set up, look at you now. Rotting in the slot like the rest of us criminals. I hit someone. The general manager. I punched her right in the face. Knocked her out cold. Fucking bitch. Yeah, she's got one of those faces you can't help but want to punch. Or sit on. Depends on the day, I guess. She slept with my fiancé. No wonder you knocked her out. Where's the fucking loyalty? I can't believe Frankie slept with her. I thought she loved me. Frankie? I used to know a girl named Frankie. A long time ago. We were both in the same unit. I was top dog at the time. She caught on my last nerve. She thought she was some kind of celebrity. She was a fucking slag is what she was. Thought she ran the place even though I was top dog. An old cunt named Jax came in one day and next thing you know she steals my job. The woman was scared shitless of her, but just because of her husband's power on the outside. So they voted her top dog. After that, I got moved to a different cell block and I never saw Frankie again. Till a few weeks ago, that is. The pitch works here now. Your Frankie and my Frankie are one and the same. Small world, too small. So what's your name, lady? Bridget. Bridget Westfall. And you are? I'm Lou Kelly. Ah, the infamous Lou Kelly. Well, it's nice to meet you, Lou. Yeah, well, now that we're best friends, tell me more about this setup. Lou and Bridget continued talking well into the night until Linda finally came to let Lou out of the slot. Time's up, Kelly. Off to your unit you go. Well, it's about bloody time. Catch you later, Bridget. Bye, Lou.
Would you want to talk to me about Jenkins? Well, I was thinking that maybe you could, like, make it so that we mums can have weekend trailer visits. What? Oh, hear me out, Mr. J. This would be good for the women, yeah? We could spend time with our babies. And the babies can get to spend time with both their parents at the same time. Boomer, the board will never approve that after all that's happened here. Come on, Mr. J, please. If anyone can make the board change their mind, it's you. You'll at least give it a try, won't ya? <sighs> Fine. I'll give it a shot, but don't get your hopes up. Oh, thanks, Mr. J. You're the best. Boomer left Will's office happy as can be. As she left, Vera walked in. Hey, Will, can you sign these papers, please? Yeah, sure. Any word from Jake? He still hasn't shown up for work. Was he home when you went to check on him? Uh, no, no, he wasn't home. <sighs> there was a news report last night about a body found in the park. Vera, it was the same park I buried Joan in. I know this sounds crazy, but I think it might be Jake. What? No, it can't be. Jake goes missing for days? A male body's found in the same area she was buried in? This has Ferguson's name written all over it. She's out there somewhere. Vera, I hate to say this, but I think Jake might be dead, and if he is, the freak killed him. I'm going to the police after work to tell them my suspicions. I'm gonna let them know the freak is alive. Will, you can't do that. Don't worry, I'm not gonna tell them you knew the freak was alive. I'll just tell them I have reason to believe she got away during the explosion. That way they can start looking for her. It was only a matter of time, Vera thought to herself. The police would find out the body in the park was Jake's. There was no way the police could track his death back to her at all. They'd been careful. Everything was gonna be okay. She just had to stay calm. And she had to get to Joan and warn her that Will was going to tell the corpse she was alive. Michelle sat in her unit writing a poem for Lou. Roses are red, a dead body is blue. My pussy starts throbbing whenever I think of you. <sighs> She's not going to fucking like that. Roses are red, violets are blue. Violets are blue? They're not fucking blue, they're purple. Michelle crumbled up the paper she wrote on and threw it across the unit. Lou saw the whole thing as she walked in. You always did like to throw things. Lou, hide your fear for a thing. Michelle ran up to Lou and gave her a big hug and then they kissed. Michelle had been in love with Lou since they were kids. Well, Lou loved Michelle too. I sure did. Made any new friends while I was gone? No, but I saw Boma. She is so pregnant. Yeah. Believe it or not, I'm actually happy for her. Yeah, me too. You want to know what else makes me happy? You. Oh, for fuck's sake. Whatever. I'm going to go take a shower. You want to join me? Dirty girl, are ya? Filthy. The two of them made their way to the showers. There were a few women in there. Get the fuck out, all of you. Now. The women all left the showers and it was just Michelle and Lou there. Alone at last. Michelle walked over to Lou and looked into her eyes. She'd waited for this moment for years. All she ever thought about was being with Lou and now her dreams were finally coming true. She grabbed Lou's face and kissed her. Lou kissed her back. She felt Lou's tongue dancing slowly in her mouth. She wanted this kiss to last forever. Lou picked her up and walked into one of the shower stalls. Michelle's back hit the wall as Lou kissed her. She began rubbing her body against Michelle's, and Michelle moaned with pleasure. Lou began to kiss Michelle's neck. She nibbled and licked on Michelle's flesh as Michelle slipped her hand into Lou's underwear. Slowly, she rubbed on Lou. Pressing gently at first, Lou stopped what she was doing and let herself enjoy what was happening. 
Michelle moved her finger in small circular motions, pressing down harder and harder as she moved. Lou was so sexy, Michelle thought to herself. She couldn't believe this was really happening. Michelle reached down and slid her fingers into Lou. It was hot in there. Lou held onto Michelle so tight it was hurting her, but she didn't give a shit about the pain. She liked it. Deeper and deeper, Michelle's fingers went into Lou until she felt Lou's body begin to tremble. Cries of pleasure coming from her mouth. She held Lou tight until she was done. And when the trembling stopped, Michelle jumped down off Lou. Slowly, she slid down the shower wall until she was squatting down right in front of her. She lowered Lou's pants with one swift motion and began to feast. It was the sweetest thing she'd ever tasted. She couldn't get enough. It was as if she'd been starved for years and finally given a meal. She took one of Lou's long legs and put it over her shoulder. Lou thrusted herself towards Michelle's mouth over and over until she felt herself ready to explode. When she was done, Michelle stood up and kissed Lou once more. Lou looked down at Michelle with a playful smirk on her face and said, My turn. Erica sat in her office looking at her bruised face in the mirror. The nerve of that wretched woman punching her in the face like that. It was a small price to pay, though. Surely Bridget would call off their engagement now. Just then, Frankie came barging into her office like a bat straight out of hell. She slammed the door behind her and stared at Erica dead in the eyes. I beat the shit out of you, but it looks like Bridget did a good enough job. I fully intend on pressing charges. Like hell you are. She attacked me. Yeah, after you lied and told her we slept together. I didn't lie. We did sleep together. Only because you drugged me, you sick fuck. I would have never cheated on Bridget with you or anyone. You said you loved me, Frankie. You said you wanted to be with me. With only me. I don't want you, Erica. Look, if I said I loved you, it's because I thought you were Bridget. There's nothing between us and there never will be. You gotta tell Bridget the truth. I'll tell her nothing. It's your word against mine. She believed me, Frankie. She's never gonna forgive you. Frankie walked slowly over to Erica and stood less than an inch away from her face. Erica felt her knees begin to buckle as her pussy dripped with anticipation. Suddenly, Frankie grabbed her by the chin and pushed her head against the wall. She leaned in and whispered in Erica's head. You better hope and fucking pray she does, or I'm gonna kill you. The night Vera and Joan buried Jake's body in the woods, she'd called her birth mother over in Russia. They spoke for the first time in years. Joan sat in that filthy living room remembering their conversation. I was so wrong for the way I treated you the last time we spoke all those years ago. It is okay, my sweet Katya. I knew one day you would come back to me. My sweet Sasha is gone, but, but thank God you and your little brother have come back. Dimitri? Da, my adoch. The two of you are the future of the Milankovic family. Irina and Mila made their choices. They will have to do their time. Irina avenged her mother's death. She will be away a lot longer than Mila. It will be up to you and your brother to guide them. For when the two of you are gone, it will be their turn to take over. I'll do anything you ask of me, mother. I'll be coming home soon. Dasvidaniya, mama. Joan couldn't wait to see her mother again. When they'd spoken, she felt something she'd never felt before. She felt loved, her mother's love. It was all she ever wanted. It was all she ever needed. She wondered who would she have been had she never been taken away. Just then there was a knock on her door. It was Sasha's thug. Is everything here? Yes, ma'am. All of her documents, her mobile and her wallet. Ma'am, you can call me Miss Ferguson. Of course. Miss Ferguson? What would you like me to do about the Westfall situation? The Westfall situation? Yes, Bridget Westfall. 
It's because of her your nieces are in prison, you know. And so Sasha had her set up for a murder. And this is a situation because... Before Sasha was murdered, she ordered me to have Mrs. Westfall's partner, Francesca Doyle, killed. It was to be the last act of revenge against Bridget Westfall. Everything is in place. We just need your approval. No. I want you to abort mission. The girls will do their time. So will Mr. Westfall. Leave Francesca Doyle alone. She's of no consequence. Now I need you to tell me everything you know about how my sister set up Mrs. Westfall. Do not leave out one single detail. Sasha's thug told Joan everything. How they'd hired a guy to crash into Bridget's car. How they'd snuck into the man's garage at night and planted a motion-sensitive bomb in his car set to go off the second the car made impact with Bridget's. How they timed it till after her lunch date with Frankie. That way she'd have some alcohol in her system, making it easier to frame her. She was drunk and she crashed into an innocent driver, causing a collision that resulted in an explosion which left a man dead. It was the perfect crime. Joan laughed at how the tables had turned for Bridget. She remembered that moment in Wentworth when Bridget called him a cunt and she smiled. She reveled in the fact that she alone held the keys to Bridget's freedom in her hands. What would she do with this newfound information, she wondered. Would she help clear Bridget's name, or would she let her rot in jail? Decisions, decisions. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Jackson? Uh, yes? Hi, we didn't get a chance to meet the other day at the staff meeting. I'm Elsie. Elsie Moore? The new prison psychologist? I just wanted to introduce myself. I've heard so much about you. All good things, I hope. <laughs> All great things. Listen, Will, I'm a little unsure about some of the prison protocol. I was wondering if you had some free time to help me understand everything better. Maybe we could discuss things over lunch? Oh, sorry. I have a lunch meeting today. Well, how about dinner? I know a place that's nice and quiet. My treat. Elsie gave Will a big smile, and then she reached over and picked off a piece of lint that was on Will's tie. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I absolutely cannot stand lint. No worries. So, dinner? Tonight? Sure, why not? Great! I'll make reservations. Here's my address, and you can pick me up at 7. Will smiled at Elsie before saying goodbye. Never once did he notice that Rita had been standing on the other end of the corridor watching them. She watched as Elsie shamelessly flirted with Will, touching his tie, smiling at him. What the fuck was happening, Rita wondered. She suddenly felt jealous. She could not stand seeing Will standing so close to this woman. She suddenly felt sick to her stomach at the thought of Will being with any other woman. She ran off to the toilet to be sick. I've got Doyle here to see ya. You've got ten minutes. Thanks, Miss Miles. Get the fuck out. I'm not leaving. Please, just let me explain. What's there to explain? You fucked her. I'm so sorry. I trusted you. Listen to me. It's not what you think. She drugged me. Oh, come on, Frankie. You can do better than that. It's true. She fucking drugged me. I started hallucinating. I thought she was you. She tricked me. I would have never cheated on you on purpose. You know that. You're a smart woman, Frankie. You had to have seen the signs. Her inviting you into her home so that you'd be safe. The two of you having your little lunch meetings. Where'd you think all that would lead, huh? You put yourself in a position where she could seduce you, and she did. No, you're wrong. Like hell I am. You and me, we're done. It's over, Frankie. Get out. No, I'm not leaving. It wasn't my fault. You have to believe me. Frankie grabbed Bridget by the shoulders and pleaded with her to forgive her. But Bridget would have none of it. Outside the door, Linda heard the commotion but chose to mind business. She knew better than to get involved in a lover's quarrel. 
Bridget used all the strength she had and she shoved Frankie off of her. She watched as Frankie fell to the ground. Bridget looked down at Frankie with hate in her eyes and said, I will never forgive you, Frankie. I hope those little Russian bitches kill you. Get the fuck out of my sight. Frankie got up slowly. She looked at Bridget one last time before walking out of the door. She'd lost her, and there was nothing she could do about it. Over in the laundry room, Irina stood behind the steam press. The women were all whispering and talking to themselves about how Irina killed Cassie. Mila sat next to Irina and just stared at the women with disgust. The door opened and in walked Lou and Michelle. The second Irina saw Lou, her heart began to beat a little faster. Irina was afraid of Lou, but it wasn't for the obvious reasons. Irina feared Lou because in Lou she saw herself, who she could become. She was also fond of her fingers and didn't want to risk rubbing Lou the wrong way. She knew all about Lou's love of chopping people's fingers off. And Irina was a lesbian after all, she needed her fingers. Irina also envied Lou. She wished she could be like her, afraid of nothing and no one. Irina feared so much, but she'd never let it show. Idiot Bolshaya Titsa, Sosvain Ovesuchke, Interies Nakak Dolgoeta Budit, Presde Chiem Kutoto Zadushi Teto Vosnia. Michelle looked at Mila and laughed. Interies Nakak Dolgoeta Budit, Presde Chiem Yavori Vutvoi Gribani Music, Izazun Sibiev Jovo. You speak Russian, da, bitch. Babe, you never told me you spoke Russian. That's kind of hot. What this little bitch say? Nothing worth repeating, my love. Irina here is top dog. That there is her cousin Mila. They're harmless. Mila stood up and tried to get in Lou's face, but Michelle stood in between them. Where the fuck you think you going? It's okay, babe. I got this. Oi, Milenkovich, Mila. Let's go. It's time for your psych appointment. Saved by the screws. Mila rolled her eyes at both Lou and Michelle, then walked off with Linda over to Elsie Moore's office. Inside Elsie's office, Mila sat staring at her in complete silence. What's on your mind, Mila? I do not need counseling. The governor thinks you could benefit from these sessions. I do not give a shit what the governor thinks. What does he know? If he was smart, Irina would be sitting in this chair, not me. It was her mother who was killed. Yes, but Sasha was your aunt. Surely you must be grieving her loss too. Mila just stared at Elsie, but said nothing. She hated people telling her how to fail. Her aunt Sasha did it all the time. Mila, you should feel blessed to be a part of this family considering that Dragovich was birthed. Mila, you should be ashamed of yourself. Stealing from your cousin Irina after all she's done for you. You are just like your mother. Selfish. You do not know how lucky you are that your grandmother loves you. If not for her, you would be. Mila was becoming enraged. Without warning, she jumped up and flipped over the small table next to them. The glasses of water fell and shattered. Water splattered everywhere. Elsie looked on in horror as Mila ran towards her. Help! Mila grabbed Elsie and put her in a headlock. Elsie struggled to free herself, but she couldn't. Mila was just so strong. Help! Help me! The screws heard Elsie's screams for help and sped into her office. Linda froze when she saw Mila holding a shard of glass into Elsie's eyes. Let her go, Milenkovich. 
I will not let her go. Mr. Jackson made his way over to Elsie's office after hearing the code red. Mila, it's okay, Mila. You don't have to do this. Put down the glass and let Miss Moore go. This is your fault, Mr. Jackson. I did not want to come here, but you made me come. Look at what you have done. Let her go, Mila. Mila was furious. She held Elsie tight in that headlock. The shard of glass was so close to her eyes she was afraid to blink. Mila thought about her choices. If she stabbed Elsie in the eyes, the screws would pepper spray her, send her to the slot and give her more time. More time? Oh no. Mila wasn't about to sit and went with any longer than she had to. She let go of Elsie's head and kicked her from behind. <gasps> Elsie fell forward to the ground. Mila dropped the glass and held both her hands up in the air. Mr. Jackson ran over to Elsie and helped her up. Linda and the other screws grabbed Mila and dragged her off to the slot. Are you okay? No. No, I'm not okay. That little bitch almost gouged my eyes out. Come on, let's get you down to medical. I don't know what would have happened had you not gotten here when you did. You saved my life, Will. Oh, Dimitri, my son. Dr. Miller and his mom hugged. They spent the entire day together. Nadia made him his favorite foods from when he was a little boy. They talked about so many things. Day turned to night as they sat in Nadia's living room talking about Sasha. Your sister just wanted to help free Irina and Mila. And look at what happened. They thought she was Katya. Or Joan Ferguson. That's the name she went by. Went by? Da, Mama. Surely you've seen the news. She was killed in the explosion. Oh, no. My son. Your sister is not dead. She is very much alive. What? Da. My Katia. She called me. She will be coming home to me soon. The two of you will take over and run the family business together. Dr. Miller couldn't believe what he was hearing. Joan Ferguson was alive? Oh, he knew he couldn't trust Joan. She was probably already planning a way to kill him and reign over the family herself. Oh no, Dr. Miller thought to himself. He was not going to let her do that. Mama, you don't know Katia like I do. She's evil. You can't trust her. Niet, Dimitri. She is your sister. She is no sister of mine. She is evil. You have no idea what she's capable of. Dimitri, I will not have you talking about my children this way. The two of you will get along. Dr. Miller could feel himself getting angry. The past was all coming back to him. His mother and how she forced him to choose between his family and the woman he loved. Had it not been for her putting a hit out on Drago, he would have never left Mila behind. And now, now she wanted him to share the throne with Joan Ferguson? All the hate he had for his mother came flooding back in that instant. And before he knew it, Dr. Miller was grabbing a lamp and holding it over his head. In that moment, Nadia turned around and saw him. My son, you came back for this? You should have been born a Dragovich. He swung the lamp down on top of his mother's head over and over until she'd fallen down. She laid on the floor. A pool of blood began forming under her head. With her eyes open, she lay there, her dead eyes staring into his. I'm the head of the Milenkovich family now.